Um, okay, yeah, I suppose we should probably get started. Um, so kind of similar to yesterday, there's been some updates to the code and to the notebooks. Owen posted up his solutions and so did Pierce, and then I've uploaded the CME, uh, the CME session and also the, the completed notebook from yesterday. Um, so just in my terminal here, I'm in a, a directory where I keep all of my work stuff basically. And you'll see I have a, a directory called Stellar SSW, which is where I did my git clone thing uh, from the instructions from the email. So if I change directory into my Stellar SSW thing, um, and I type git status, I'll, this is probably something like you'll see. You'll see that you have changes uh, from executing the notebooks. As I said before, there's kind of two options. You can just um, basically undo the changes or you can commit the changes back up. Um, I think it's probably worthwhile to commit the changes so that you have them, in which case you'd want to basically do git add-u. And what that says is basically um, add all of the modified files. So all, all of these ones in green and ignores all of these other ones, which I don't want to deal with. Um, and now if we do a git status, um, it says that these changes are going to be committed. And then so I can do a git commit. And it's going to bring me, in my case, it's going to bring me into VI, but it should just open up some sort of text editor and where you can type, you know, um, whatever you want. Um, I can't type. Um, and then we're back, basically back to a, a clean repo. Um, and then also from yesterday. Sorry, Shane, just um, um, that last step that you did where you edited something in VI, were you just adding an arbitrary name there? Or, or what, what was the point of that? That's the commit message. So if um, so, basically, whenever you do git commit, it, it will open up some form of text editor. And it yeah. depends on what your system exactly what it opens up. But then that's what will show up in the git log. So if we do git log, so this is a log of all of the commits. So you'll see that's the one that I just made. And the idea is to have a message that describes what was changed. So you'll see oh, yeah. my last commit was add complete radio spectra and CME notebooks. Um, and usually these should be nicely named because obviously that's kind of uh, useful. That isn't so much, but I mean, this is just a, a, a demo repo, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, just so I'm, just, I'm just giving a, a note on, on the content of the update, really. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it can be more than one line. I mean, you can do lots of stuff, but don't want to get bogged down in too much. For now, it's blah, blah, blah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And then from yesterday, hopefully, Everyone should have uh, something similar to this. You'll have origin, which will be GitHub, and then your username here, and then Stellar SSW tutorial, and then also upstream, which is the main repo where all, where all, all of the up-to-date code is. And so to get all of the up-to-date code, you git pull uh, upstream main. Um, I don't want to do that. Yeah. It, like that should work for you guys. I just don't want to run it because it's going to overwrite stuff that I have um, here. But if you do that, um, that should give you some output. And then if you ls in the day three CME session, you should have um, this notebook. Hopefully, that's working for everyone. Um, as I was just saying as well, I'll pop this into the chat that Laura very kindly put some <sighs> Git remote minus V doesn't show me anything. Is it comment? Yeah, we've seen that. Uh, it should show something. It has yeah. to show something. You, you need to make sure that you're in the right directory though, because um, the one? Uh, yeah, so yeah. So like, if you're not in the directory where um, you cloned the stuff originally. Um, Maybe show Shano when you do ls minus la, if you're in a git directory, you'll see a, like a dot git file. I think 
No, Amazon Windows though is is, is what we uh, what we've so yeah, uh, yeah. So right. if, yeah, yeah they, if you are on yeah. Linux or Mac and you do an ls a, you'll see this dot git folder which tells you that that you're in a git repo. Um, I'm on Windows. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it should say something, but I'm just going to go through this first. So the first thing is, if you go to the GitHub repo, which I posted, there's all of the instructions that we talked about before um, and some more instructions about uh, how to keep up to date. The other thing is um, that you can launch the binder links. Um, so I've actually done this and I've executed a bunch of the, the things, so it all works. So if if you just can't get it working, just use the binder links because it's more important that you follow along now and try and figure out any problems you have with your local setup later on, I would suggest. Um, so that's that. Um, and then again, uh, if you've successfully managed to um, pull down um, the, uh, the code, then you need to activate your Jupyter environment. So for you guys, that should be kind of activate Stellar. Um, underscore SSW, I think. Um, I don't use Conda. So for me, the equivalent command is work on um, Stellar SSW. And what should happen is it should change the prompt to indicate that you're now in that environment. And then again, we want to launch Jupyter Notebook to start the notebook session. And that should then open your browser. And it should open your browser to uh, basically this page here. Sorry, Shane. Um, just uh, on that, um, you said uh, Conda activates Stellar. Uh, yeah, it's it's in the instructions here. I don't remember the actual command. Yeah, so it's this one here. Let me make it bigger. SWW. Yeah. I think most of this stuff should tab complete. To 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 be honest, um, it does for me anyway. So I don't have to remember what these things are called. Um, but yeah, so it should be kind of activate and then sell your SSW. And then you should notice that your prompt changes from whatever it was before to then start with Stellar. My, 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 mine is saying could not find Conda environment Stellar SS, SWW. I presume it's not SSW. It's, yeah, it, it, it's, um, okay, I'll tell you exactly what it is. Give me one second. Yeah, I just, I don't use Conda. Oh, it is. It's Stellar SSW. No. Yeah, it's it's Stellar SSW. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. No, no, no. I'm just trying. I mean, yeah. I'm sure other people are having these issues. If if you're not, um, okay. yeah, I think that that's just a typo because Laura is used used to typing SSW for SolarSoft, and yeah. But the key thing is, your prompt should change, and it should change to this. Yeah. Um, right. And then once you're in this, you can then do Jupyter Notebook. And it should open up a browser and you should get to a page. I mean, make this a bit bigger, like this. Um, so hopefully everyone is um, following along and there's no massive problems. Again, as I said, if there is any massive problems, you can just use the binder versions by clicking this link and it will yeah it will launch a nice binder session um um shane the yeah. did we have to kind of update the environment no there? not today not okay. today right okay we only had to kind of update the environment yesterday because uh we added some packages to the requirements file but this time it's just code so we're, we're good in that sense. Uh, yeah. Shane, could I ask you, please? Um, yeah, of course. Is there any limitation on using that binder version? Uh, mine crashed a few times on me yesterday. I couldn't get the thing to work. Yeah, so you'll notice, OK, I'll, I'll let this finish spinning up. But basically, it's, it's limited to 2 gig of RAM, I think. Yeah, I saw that. And it has limited uh, CPU. Um, like resources. So sometimes what you have to do is basically um, restart the kernel and just try and rerun it a couple of times so it gets everything basically downloaded. Um, I 
it's just because it's a free resource it is slightly limited um, yeah no i mean it, it worked reasonably okay for me in the heel of the hunt but uh, it, it did it did crash out a little bit yeah no to be honest when i was testing the notebooks which i'll show in a second once this decides to finish loading and uh, i had to basically rerun them a couple of times for it to actually execute fully and again i think it's just yeah they're, they're, they're very very low power instances um which is also why it's 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 handy to be able to run this stuff locally or on a server or, or whatever and um, so that you can get uh use the full resources of your computer um uh, while that's spinning up, I will just briefly, I want to go back to uh, yesterday. So I've now uploaded this Radio Spectre demo complete notebook, which has all of the commands to do everything. Um, and they're all filled in. And I've tried to add some more comments here and there to make things hopefully a little bit clearer. Um, and then when I was doing it, I actually noticed that there is a really nice um, fundamental and harmonic emission in the Greenland e Callisto data. So if you see it, mm. look at this. Yep. Um, so yeah, so there's a nice fundamental and har harmonic emission just there in the Greenland data. I know, I presume people have already published loads of work on this event because it's so famous, but um, yeah, that was just interesting. Nice I, I wouldn't be so sure, actually. <laughs> yeah, there's actually a, a nice bit of fine structure in there as well. Um, I, uh, yeah. Is that not the event that's in Kira's paper? Is it? I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure it is, yeah. Is it? Yeah. Uh, it looks, yeah. Yeah, it it's is. Yeah. on the wall next to me. Oh, she's the only one too. <laughs> okay, right. There we go. Anyways, uh, just showing that you can you can find some nice stuff pretty easily. Uh, but that's all up there now, so you can run it from Binder and it should work. Um, so back to what Joe asked me. So this is now running on Binder, which you should you can tell it's not my local link. And if I go into, I go into the, the radio session and I'll open the notebook. Um, take a second. And if I do cell run all, the chances of it actually fully executing are kind of low. Basically, you'll see that it should get so far and it might stop. And what you have to do is just restart the kernel using this button and then do cell run all a couple of times. I just because it's downloading stuff um, and processing a, a lot of data, sometimes it just hangs. So if that does happen, just restart the kernel and go to cell, run all, and eventually it should, um, should work. But moving on to today. So what are we gonna to cover today? Basically try and look at some CME data and basically try and pull out a height time plot and fit some simple models to it. Um, it's going to follow a very similar format to before. We're going to search and download some, some data, some chronograph images. We're going to load them into maps. We're going to have to do a bit of really, um, not, not basic, that's not the right word, but kind of standard image processing techniques to try and enhance the CME front. And we'll, we'll find out why uh, later on. Then we'll extract the CME front positions, uh, convert these positions to, to heights and then fit some models to high time data. That's what we're going to try and do. I should point out that what I'm doing is not strictly the most accurate way of doing it. It wouldn't be sufficient for science, you know, publication quality stuff, but it's just to give people an idea of what's involved. And it, it's not far off what we'd have to do for a publication. Um, but there are a couple of little bits that I just decided to ignore because it was easier. Um, so I'm going to get started unless there's any other general questions or anything. Um, see there's some stuff going on in Slack, but uh, mm -hmm. what you uh, I don't think so. I think there's two of us with the same problem there with that previous completed notebook, Shane. Uh, what, sorry, what is it? Which, which Slack channel are we in or what, what's the message? That's on radio. radio. Hands on radio. Okay, right. And and what's there? Uh, unable notebook. Sure. That should have been in hands on CME, right? Uh, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I just didn't know where to look. Uh, error loading notebook. Um, radio expected demo complete not adjacent. I have not seen that before. 
Um, it's, it's like there's a permissions issue on the file. And if if you do a, a git status, what does that show you? Um, yeah, so if I... Basically, as soon as you open the, the notebooks, they, they usually get changed. Uh, Yeah, I'm able to. Notebook did not appear. Yeah, it sounds like it's corrupted or something. To be honest, that's what that looks like. But I, the, when I try and open in the browser, it's okay here. And all, just, all of the uh, all, all of the different commit and status commands that you you went through earlier all worked, and the um, conda environment change worked as well and it opened th th this page okay yes and so it was only when you tried to launch the actual cme session yeah. by ipynb that, that that it crashed whereas, whereas the other uh well, my notebook um, files open fine it's just the demo complete doesn't open up so example day the one. example opens okay um, what about the CM the CME session one though? Does that work? Is that's kind of what? Or is this? Hold on. Um, yeah, that works fine. Okay. Well, that's what we're going to focus on today. So maybe we can try and resolve the issues with the other other other, other notebooks um, later on, or in 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 Slack on on a sidebar or whatever. Um, so yeah, goals: search, download load into maps, do some basic CME front enhancement, extract positions as a function of time, and convert these positions into heights, and then fit some height time, some simple models to the, to, to, to the height time data. Um, so the standard imports, there's a couple of extra ones here. Um, why won't this go? Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, just because uh, we need some extra packages. So. The same as before, this should be getting a little bit repetitive now. Um, we're going to use FIDO to search for some data. So we give it a time range. Again, it's all from this event on uh, the 10th, that big X-class flare, just because it's such a nice event to look at. Although we'll see that in the chronograph data, it's not so nice. It's actually almost too fast. Um, and so in this instance, I'm going to look for LASCO data, which we talked, which we heard Richard Harrison speak about earlier on. So LASCO is a chronograph on Soho, and it's really our only regular source of chronograph images, um, at least along the Sun Earth line today. And then I'm going to look, we're going to do it by detector. So C2 is the inner chronograph. It images from, I don't know, two and a half to five, I think. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's the inner chronograph, so it's closer to the sun, basically. So we'll do our query, um, and then we'll get back our query response. And so we'll see that we've got a bunch of files there. Looks like 12 minutes apart. Um, they're, yeah, they have a, a particular extent type and a size, standard stuff, really nothing to worry about. We're gonna download these results again. So it's the same idea. We just pass the, um, the query into Fido fetch, uh, and that, that will go off and download things. Uh, don't worry about that, that, that these are messages, they, they can be ignored. Um, and again, we get the results, which are a list of files. Um, and then what I'm going to do is load them into map objects. So it's very similar to what we did in, in Radio Spectre yesterday, except this time we're using map. We just pass in the list of files to map, and this time, we give it this extra keyword called sequence equals true. That basically tells SumPy that these are a sequence of maps from the same instrument, and they can kind of be interpreted as a sequence in time. Uh, and if we do that, and then I execute the plot command, uh, do I have to execute all these? What do I do? Yeah. It will open. Hey, Shane, up. sorry to interject. Yep. I'm not downloading anything with the Fido fetch. Are you seeing the results table? Uh, I see the results table, yeah. And then the C2 results, you can find it off fetch C2 query. Uh, I get an empty progress bar. And then the C2 results just gives me an empty 
thing. Um, maybe, maybe Sarah, I'll work on it on my own time. Sorry, maybe I no, should no, put no, it in. No, um, and it's definitely C2 queries is not empty. And just double checking, and there's no typos or anything. Uh, yeah, C2 query gives me results from one provider, 14 results from the yeah. So I just exited um, these anyways. I mean, yeah. it, again, yeah, it, it, it was working on, it works on my end. I got to the image. Okay. Um, I'm not Okay, maybe sure. I need to do something funny. Oh, what you could do, what you could do is sometimes if there's, um, you, you could try it. Overwrite equals true. Sometimes if there's problems downloading the data, it won't download them properly. And then the results object can, can be empty. So if you have overwrite equals true, it should try and re-download them. You could maybe give that a shot. Uh, sure. Um, doesn't seem to have been the magic fix, but I'll tip okay. along on my own here and just sort of check in every now and then. OK. Um, yeah, Pierce, I'm getting a. A file downloaded zero percent on on that, even with the overwrite equals true. Well, it worked for you Owen, recently, or like earlier today, or just now. I mean, it, it could work. It worked just now for me. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it worked yeah. for me too. I was yeah. able to download the data at least. Okay. Well, yeah. somebody said something specific to you guys. It could be that I don't know. They've blocked you from doing oh. actions or something. Yeah, like both of us are in the office here, so maybe. I have not work yeah, yeah. Dot, I, dot SIT. Um, state at home. Uh, yeah, but if you, you do get them downloaded, um, you should be able to load them into the map and then plot it like this. Um, and what do they want to say about this? Uh, Is, yep. I'm, I'm getting an, uh, a JavaScript error IPython is not defined. Do you know, have you seen this before? When I tried to plot the map. Um, I'll just no. stack overflow it. If you, if not. I, I mean, that doesn't seem like it's even possible. Yeah. Because it's part of uh, Jupiter. Um, but what I was going to try and say is that yeah, this doesn't want to work. Uh, anyway, hang on a sec. You got IPython installed, uh, Cameron? I'm not sure. Um, I, I saw that it says uh, that you should use matplotlib inline. Yeah, but that that should already be done at the very top. So if you see here, that's like one of the. Well, it says things. notebook, map outlet, notebook, not inline. Oh yeah. So if you do inline, basically, the the plots would be non-interactive, so you can't do anything with the plots. Okay. Um, so so I should really have installed. It I should be part. It should be part of it though. I mean, if yeah. if, if you if you did the, the Conda setup environment thing, like it's it's part of, um. Uh, Jupiter. Um, so I'm not, not too sure. Again, as, as always, you could always try and close Jupyter Notebook and restart it and uh, turn it on off again, the standard, yeah. the standard kind of um, thing. But um, there's this IPy uh, MPL. Yeah, you don't need that. I, I, I wouldn't recommend that actually um, because uh, some of the stuff later on won't work. Um, but yeah. But so what should I do? Um, I don't know. Again, I would really say just launch the binder, the binder notebook, and, and use that for the moment because that will will eventually work. Right? Like, it's the same environment. I don't know how. Um, because basically all it does is it install these things and, uh, yeah. Okay. The stuff that we need is 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 there. Um. But. What we get in the end is a nice little summary plot like this, uh, where we can look at the images um, basically through time. And lo and behold, there is a CME. There's a really nice, actually, CME. Um, and we can see it's incredibly fast. It's basically uh, only in the field of view for like two frames. Yeah, 
So it's incredibly fast. Um, what's also interesting to see is that if you keep going on, all this snow, all of these little dots and, and kind of uh, lines, that's actually accelerated particles hitting the detector from the flare. Um, so the first thing we might notice is that it's pretty faint and difficult to see. Um, you could probably do something uh, on this image, but uh, a standard technique that we that we usually do is is called um, base differencing. Um, and coronagraphs can take a lot of different images. They can take polarized brightness and they have different filters. And we need to make sure that we're comparing like images with like images. So on this line, I'm just basically printing the exposure time and uh, the polarization and the type of filter uh, for each of the maps. And you can see that they're all the same. And uh, the exposure time is slightly different, but um, we're going to normalize by the exposure time anyways. So that means I can kind of use all, all of these maps together, that they're compatible at least to interpret in, in the way I want to. And then this line, what this does is, um, if you remember from uh, some of our other work that this CME should actually be going that way. And if you look at the plot axes, they're going from uh, positive to negative uh, and positive to negative rather than the other way around. And that's because that's the native coordinates of the map. Um, and if we want it to be the right way around, uh, we need to rotate the map. And what this will do is basically uh, rotate the map so that solar north is up uh, the, the way we expect it to be. And, and the east-west limbs are in the correct position. Um, and that, yeah, basically we just call rotate on each map and SunPy takes care of a lot of stuff for us. Um, so into some, some processing. So again, if, if we look at these images, there's like a lot of brightness there, even before the CME comes into the field of view. Uh, it's just really bright. And this here is the arm that actually holds the occulting disc in front of the telescope. So that, that's why it's dark in this region. Um, so why is that? Well, the corona is dominated by the F corona in this region, which is light, light, rally scattered off dust particles. It's incredibly bright because it's photospheric radiation. And uh, basically, it, most of the time, that's a very bright CME, but most of the time, it's much, much brighter than the CMEs. So there's a number of techniques that we use to try and enhance the CME front. Uh, we have something called running difference. So basically, for every image I, we can subtract the previous image from it and create a new image. It's called a running difference movie, and it highlights, it highlights changes, hence why it's called a, a running difference. We can use base differencing, where for each image, we subtract a base image, i.e. Uh, a pre-event image uh, from uh, each image in the series, and we get a base difference image, or the kind of background subtraction where um, this F corona is slowly varying over time. So if you take lots of observations, you can kind of model it as, as a background, um, and you, you can subtract that away and get a background subtracted image. Um, for today, we're going to look at running base just because it's kind of, I think, the easiest and it works quite well for this particular event. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to explain this a little bit more. So basically, we want to create a, a series of base difference maps. So in base difference, I want to take my image at I and subtract some base image that I define. So this bit here is basically my image at time uh, time I. I know it's I plus one, but uh, you'll see why in a second. And then, as I mentioned before, we're going to normalize this by exposure time, because the exposure time does vary, even though it's not a lot. And so that's our um, basically this image here. So, And then we want to subtract a base image. And in this, this particular case, I'm just going to define my base image as the first image in the sequence, because if I go back up here and look at the first image, you can see in the first couple of images, nothing changes. There's no real event happening and there's nothing going on. So this is probably a reasonable um, base image to subtract um, moving forward. And then I'm just going to create a map for each one of these. So it's going to be image I minus my base image. I have to give it the metadata, which is basically the date and the time and things like that. Um, and I'm going to 
do it for each map uh, that I have. And that's going to create a series of um, running, running base images. If I do these, we can really clearly see the CME front. Now, a couple of things. Now it's on the right side. It's where we expect it to be. So it's on uh, the, the west limb. Um, and also, we can see this shock structure that we were talking about before. And um, so you'll see that the core of the CME is this kind of structure in here. And then all of this kind of really smooth uh, curved front, that's basically the shock structure that we were talking about before. Um, and then I can keep going and we'll see that the shock basically keeps expanding uh, quite a lot, really. Uh, and then we see lots of complicated, complex material being ejected um, in the aftermath. And there's all the snow again. You can really see how much radiation is thrown at the detector in these maps. Um, so we now have um, our relatively nice CME images. So what can we do to try and um, help us extract the CME front? Uh, usually what I would do is I would basically plot each image and then just point and click. It's known point and click analysis. There, there are like lots of uh, fancier ways of doing it, but a pretty standard technique is to just point and click along the line. Um, but uh, because Jupyter Notebook is just annoying, uh, that didn't work. So instead we're going to uh, create basically those J maps that Richard Harrison was talking about earlier on. Another name for them is uh, space time diagrams or distance time plots. So I'm going to extract this region from each map. I'm going to sum the coordinates in the y direction. So I get basically a, a single profile, and then I'll stack them for each time. And um, so maybe I have a sorry to interrupt you. I know no, no. you have a question from Mohammed. Oh yeah, where are we? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I would like to know why do we normalize the images before uh, subtraction? Why don't um, we just subtract the images? Uh, well, because so in this case, the exposure times are all pretty similar. But you see this one here. And uh, this one is mm -hmm. not yeah. significantly longer, but it is, it is longer than the rest. And so if you just subtract them without normalizing them, um, you're basically subtracting incorrect quantities from, from one another. So we need to normalize by the exposure time uh, before we subtract or else you subtract basically what is too bright of an image and, and you get like a, a, a false, uh, you get a, an incorrect base difference image. It's just to do with the exposure time and the units. Because if we convert everything to digital numbers per second, which is what we get when we divide by the exposure time, we can then subtract them from, from each other. It's um, a fairly standard process because some of these could be drastically different. So, you know, if one of these was 10 and one of them was 100 and you try to subtract them from each other, um, it's not going to work. Um, so I hope that explains yeah, um, why. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. No worries, no worries. Um, okay, so I want to draw this box for each map in my sequence. I want to extract it and then I want to sum over the coordinates. And so this builds on what Laura was telling you guys about, that I'm going to define a coordinate in arc seconds. So I want it to be 0, minus 200. So that's the bottom left coordinate, which would be there. And the top right coordinate, which is 6,500 arc seconds, 500. So I define my box, and then I create a submap by passing it in the bottom left coordinate and the top right coordinate. And that basically just extracts the maps. Um, and what I get left with is a map that's um, 34 pixels by 500 pixels, uh, which is essentially this, this little box. And then what I want to do is stack them in time and plot them. And um, so ignore this for a second. This has nothing to do with what I'm saying. But basically, uh, I can stack them and plot them as a function of, of essentially time. And that's what, what I'm doing in this in this little, little cell here. And then what's nice is this bit of code just like, like actually allows us to kind of point and click on these images. Um, so I'm going to point and click um, maybe there. 
So we've now point and clicked, and basically we have these. Uh, I just put in some false values so that the notebooks would run online without people having to do anything. But you can see we now have this variable called C2 front pixels. Uh, and basically, you can see that the first number is the pixel uh, position, basically um, along this direction. So it's going this way. Um, and the second number is basically the, the index or the, 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 the time uh, of the slice. So we've got 12 images, we have 12 slices. Um, and then we can basically overplot one of them to make sure that we're not going you know, we're not doing anything crazy. And um, so basically what this line does is it takes our, our front information, uh, we create a plot, and then we plot our C2 image. Um, and then we overplot basically the coordinates that we just clicked on. And so it's not, not amazing. I should probably really move it out to, to the right a little bit. Um, but for the purposes of this demo, um, we'll, we'll continue. So now I have, I only got two coordinates because this CME was so fast. It was only in the Lasco C2 field of view for basically two, 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 two images. And um, so I want to extract my times, um, which I can do. Um, because again, if we look at the indices, and um, so this is maybe remember the index for a map, it goes from three to four. Um, so List index out of range. Maybe, Mohammed, you said earlier on that it was only downloaded 71%. Yeah. So maybe not all of the images downloaded and it's trying to cycle through all of them, they're not all there. Yeah, I would try to download the data again. Maybe something happened during the downloading. Yeah, the downloads can sometimes be slightly annoying, but it's not really, um, it's, yeah, can't really fix that in, in, in SunPy. Um, but I mean, what you can do I'll is and, just- I was going to say, yeah, maybe I can try and put them in uh, a tarball and then send them around. Yeah, 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 but they won't be in the right place then, so. Oh, true. But you can, yeah, yeah. As I said, Maybe we'll just go to the notebook and then at the end, we'll try and solve people's problems. Because uh, as I said, you, you should be able to follow along um, with the online uh, notebooks. Um, okay, so assuming we now have our pixel coordinates um, and our map indices, we can then basically extract our times, uh, which is just the, the date from the map. And then basically we use, uh, so this is a little bit complicated, but this function does what it says. It takes a pixel coordinate and gives us back the world coordinate or the arc seconds um, in our map coordinate system. Uh, and basically I'm telling it to basically take each of my front pixels and um, the center of this, uh, this box. So basically I say the center of this box and out however many pixels I clicked. And then I'm gonna take that um, and convert it into coordinates and then I can print them out. So I get a list of times uh, which matches up. This image is from 1600.05, 1600 the next one is the next image which should be 12 minutes later and it is and these are the positions as sky coordinates which Laura introduced us to which we're going to use later on. Um, so we now have our CME front in C2 and we can do the exact same thing for C3. Uh, it's the same process. I do my query. Um, I'll get my results. Download them. Um, yep. I make a sequence of maps and then I plot the maps. Um, because I've got however many 12 maps and it has to do a fair bit of processing, it can take a while for this, this line to display. And so you can tell by the fact this is black and this is a star, it's still computing in the background. So I'm just going to give it a minute 
but essentially we're going to do the same process now for our C2 images. So we're going to track our CME from, from C2 into C3. Um, and then once we have that done, we can, we can go on to the slightly more interesting part and we can try and model it and see when we think that CME would arrive at an Earth-like distance, even though it's not Earth-directed. This clearly isn't Earth-directed, it was off the, the limb CME, but we can show you what, what you, you could do. Um, Look at these areas. Um, did you ever get anywhere with your iPython is not defined, Calvin? No. No, I even tried installing iPython. Some, oh, I have I have iPython. It's, for some reason, the browser doesn't like it. I went over to to the binder versions, and I think they're running fine. Yeah, uh, okay. how, how do I get there? I'm sorry. I, I oh, no, you're it. fine. You're fine. I'll, 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 I'll post the link for your name in a second. Um, I mean, in general, if you go to the, the repo, you can just click on this button, but I'll, I'll post the actual oh, link. Okay. Um, I'll post the link in the chat if you give me one. So, okay. Yeah, mine, my, mine didn't render as a web page. It rendered, rendered as source code at that page. Or oh. Maybe there's a button to convert. No, I, I, that should be fine. I mean, if it doesn't work, give me a shout. But yeah, it should, you, should, you can click it. It's just going to load a binder in, in, in the background. Um, I, I just tried again. I tr the first time I tried it, I got something weird. And the second time, it loaded up OK as in the binder. Yeah. As I said, I mean, these are free resources. There could be loads of people using binder right now. Um, I mean, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. Okay, right. So I've downloaded my maps. I've downloaded my files. I've loaded them into maps again using the sequence equals true keyword to let SunPy know that these are a sequence of images from the same instrument, so they can be treated as like basically a, you know, a time series or a sequence of images in time. And then I get my nice little uh, preview plot, and I can scroll through the Im images again. And so here you can see these basically no sign of a CME, except for the fact that we're seeing the particle impacts on the detector. So we know that there's been some sort of event. There's no sign of the CME. And again, this is just a demonstration of how bright that F corona is. It's much, much brighter thousands of times, uh, depending on how far you are away from the sun uh, than the background. So we're going to play the same, the same game. Uh, we're going to do our base difference image to try and uh, bring out the CME front so we can image it. Um, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll execute this. So again, the same commands. We're going to rotate it because again, um, these are inverted. So it's going from positive to negative because that's the underlying coordinate system of the observation. But we want it to be the correct way around. And the same idea, I'm going to normalize um, my images by their exposure time. Uh, and I'm going to subtract the first image. So we're creating base difference images, um, essentially. And then let's see if we can plot, uh, or if we can make it the CME front. And it turns out we can, because there's a there's a giveaway image of <laughs> what it's going to look like in a minute. Um, again, especially if you're on Binder, this can take a while, because they, they don't have that much resources. Um, it's taken quite a while on my laptop. Probably because I've got lots of stuff open. Maybe I should close these. Yeah, I'm close some of these. And these are quite small images. These, these images are only 1K by 1K. So you can imagine when you're trying to do stuff with AIA, uh, it can be time consuming. Is there 4K by 4K? Uh, uh, I have a question, please. Uh, can we uh, rotate that rectangle uh, with an, some angle instead of doing it uh, vertically or perpendicular? 
Um, uh, yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, you can't do it the way that I'm doing it right now because um, the way that where is this where is this gone? Let me find out where I am so I can try and demonstrate this properly. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Right. So the way it works is this takes a bottom left hand and a top right hand corner. Um, and there's no way for this particular method to, to, to do an off angle. Like you can't do a, a rectangle that's basically not aligned uh, with the vertical and horizontal axis with this command. But what you could do is you could rotate the image so that the image was rotated, so it was aligned along um, where the CME was going, or there are other options. And uh, again, this was just kind of the most straightforward way I, I, I could think of demonstrating this. Um, there's actually discussion ongoing right now uh, and some point about how we can make this a bit easier for this type of analysis. Um, it's not super straightforward. Is there like an interpolation function, yeah? For 2D images to get like a slice at any angle? Um, is there? You, yeah. I mean, there is a function that you can do or that you can say, I think it's get data at chord or get, basically there's a function and you can give it a sky chord and it'll tell you the data that's at that sky chord. So you could figure out all of the coordinates in a given box and then get all of the values. But um, that, yeah, that would just be more complicated and I just did, didn't want to do that for this particular um, demo. So in, in short, at the moment, that's not straightforward, but of course you can. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, it, it's images in Python. So, you know, if, if you need to do something, there's definitely a way, but it might not be super straightforward currently. Um, so now, again, I've just basically, I'm just uh, quick looking our new base difference maps. And now we see a nice CME front, a uh, shock and CME front propagating out through the field view. Again, it gets really, really swamped by uh, particle uh, hits due to the radiation later on, but we can see a nice uh, CME front. And again, you can really see the shock because the shock is this kind of really smooth structure uh, further out and the CME front is actually behind it uh, in there somewhere. So you can do the same trick as before. Um, oh yeah, just in order to remove these, some of these, this is called salt and pepper noise. A lot of times it's just these black and white dots. And uh, to remove them, I just ran a small, uh, a median filter over the image. It just replaces each pixel by the median of uh, some neighboring pixels just to improve the image quality and try and enhance the front. And you can see in this image that the, the salt and pepper noise is a lot less, but these uh, streaks are still left because uh, yeah, it can't be filter them out. That's actually a really good question, Mohammed, about the arbitrary orientation thing. I have to raise that with the SunPy folks. But these are the sort of questions that are great because, you know, if, if no one asks for this sort of stuff, then sometimes we don't think about it because it's not something that we would try to do. Um, so it's, it's really useful. Um, okay, so yeah, now we can make my nice little plot. Um, And yeah, if you do get an error about the but the index being incorrect in one of these, I mean, you can just try a different a different image. If it didn't download them all, there, there mightn't be nine of them. So you could zero should all, always work. But I was just trying to pick images that show where the CME front is. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna zoom in here a little bit. Yeah, so there's a the CME front, and again, I'm gonna play the same game. I'm gonna define a box. I'm going to extract that box. I'm going to sum over pixels and make what, what's known as a, a space time diagram. Or uh, usually when it goes further out, like with the heliospheric images, it's called a, a J, J map. So again, the same thing. 
for each of our maps, I specify bottom left coordinate, top right coordinate, and then I extract my sub map and just append it to my list of sub maps. And so I'm going to run that line, I'm going to run this line. Um, and now you can see something that's maybe looking a bit more like you expect. So again, I could go along and do my point and click, which is really subjective because you might be clicking somewhere else to where I'm clicking. And that's something that as a, as a group we've looked at before. Um, and that's why, oh no, that's not good. Um, um, why we looked at, into automated methods of detecting CME fronts because they're a bit less prone to human error, but they have have their own problems. Um, so basically, we end up with a list of the same idea. It's the pixel coordinates of uh, in the x direction, basically. So this direction along the map, and the index number in a list. And um, so three, four, maybe, uh, five, etc. And again, we can uh, overplot them. Uh, I'm just going to redefine this because I made a, a mess of trying to plot it a second ago, or trying to do the point and click a second ago. Um, but we can pick a specific image and try and overplot and make sure that we're looking at the right structure. Now, we could argue all day about, am I clicking on the CME front or not? Uh, and that's um, definitely a valid question and something that you need to be careful of when, when you're doing this type of analysis. But just for the moment, we won't. But we can check a bunch of images. And it seems like I'm kind of following the same, the same sort of structure. Um, and so again, I can extract my times and extract my coordinates. And we'll get a list of coordinates and times. So now. I have a list of times from each telescope and a list of essentially uh, sky coordinates for each telescope. How can I convert that to um, height times? So what I want to do is um, All right. So do you see a blank whiteboard now? This is my question. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Sure. Yeah, okay, so yeah. Hopefully. Oh, the drawing is also blank if you're writing anything. No, <laughs> I'm drawing anything <laughs> yet. You're getting ahead of me. Okay. Um, so basically, the idea is that um, at the moment, what we have is, if you can imagine this is a picture of our sun, and we have our telescope over here. Uh, and what we have is essentially, um, let me draw this properly. We have this angle. And so this is an angle we'll call it uh, theta. Yeah, so we have an angle of theta and we know the distance uh, between our telescope and the sun. And what we can do is we can make a plane of sky approximation. So we're gonna assume that we have a right angle here. Um, so we draw a line that connects our observer to the center of the sun. We then draw a plane, which is at a right angle to that. This is called the plane of the sky, the POS for short. And then we can just use some, some basic trig to figure out uh, the position or the height of this point uh, above the solar surface. Okay, so we've just found these things. We found our theaters. So we can now just use a, a simple equation and. Uh, what is it? Opposite over hypotenuse. Uh, yeah, so tan. So basically, tan. Uh, oops. It's really difficult to do this with a mix. I really need one of those pens. Um, but yeah, hopefully that's that's clear to everyone. So we know the distance between our spacecraft and the center of the sun. We know its position, which means we can define this line. Uh, we're then making an assumption that it's in the plane of the sky. This might not be true, but we're going to make an assumption that it is in this plane. And then we can figure out what this height value is 
using this angle and this distance. So hopefully that's clear enough. That's exactly what I'm going to do basically in code now in a second. Any? But where more? where was the? You said you got angles. Yeah. Um. You were when you were clicking on the image. Could you not just use the plane of sky distances? Or maybe I misinterpreted what you're doing. The plane of sky. But I I just had arc seconds then. That's that's not that's not a. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'll show you what I mean. So I'll go back and share this screen again. Um. So maybe I'll just go in here for a second. So if I print uh, one of my C, not cap C3. C3 chord zero. So it's a sky chord. But the main thing is it's TX and TY in arc seconds. So they're, they're angles. So I have no idea about where that is in, in, in real space. It's just an angle from an observer. So in order to convert this into real space, I have to make some assumption. And the assumption that I'm going to make is that it's in the plane of the sky to convert to an actual yeah. height above the surface. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, so I mean, it's not too difficult, but basically sea observer radius is the distance from the sun to our spacecraft times the tan of the angle. Uh, because the y angle is so small, I'm just going to ignore it because it should make things a little bit easier. Um, but basically, that's me converting our observed angle into uh, uh, basically an array of heights. And underscore POS is because it's plane of sky. I just wanted to indicate that it's, it's plane of sky. And then I can also estimate an error. Um, so basically, what I did here was I took our angle and I added um, basically five pixels of error. It's probably too small, but just to give you an idea that you can do proper, proper errors. Um, so then I have an array of times and an array of uh, heights. And uh, don't worry about this for the moment. Um, if you, yeah, okay, well, if you don't want to do it yourself, SunPy has a way of doing this for you, um, but it makes a slightly different assumption. Um, so instead of assuming it's on the plane of the sky, so that's a, a plane perpendicular to our line of sight, it assumes that it's on a sphere that's projected, um, basically uh, a sphere centered on the observer at the radius of the center of the sun. Don't worry about this, uh, it's not too important, but we can basically get uh, some estimates. And then we can plot our height time, uh, which is and we start to get something a bit more interesting. And so there's our height time. So uh, I don't know why I decided to do this, but that's the time. So 16, 16, 15, 16, 30. And this is the height in our sun. OK, so can you, can you go back to coordinate definition, C3 coords, where you define those coords? Oh, yeah. Have you, have, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, OK, really? so between 3 and 12. I get an index error there, even if I use well, if I use your C three front picks as you've defined them. You know, you you you've defined them yeah. just in case we could click. So can you just print the len of of C three sub maps? Because if C three sub yeah, I and it's eighteen. Okay, and you get an index error when you go three twelve. Yeah, it's weird. I also got an index error. I went back and picked the points again, and I picked a couple of extra points second time around, and it did work that time. Uh, yeah. It's, it's like it's not actually taking account of actually how many points you've put into the array. I mean, this is super hacky. Like, this is not the way I would do this. I was trying to make it work in Jupyter Notebook so that it would work for everyone because, yeah. Uh, so it's definitely not... <laughs> Not uh, you know, no. yeah. Okay, three and twelve. Um, I mean, the so you can see the important thing is when if you look at your your C three front picks or your C two front picks, it doesn't matter. Uh, this should be close to an integer. Um, if you've clicked way off to one side, I could maybe we could potentially go a bit haywire. 
um, because it's it's just you know, in this case I have I guess seventeen images, no, I have eighteen images as well. Yeah, so I, I, there is eighteen images uh, that I have, and they're indexed from zero to seventeen. Um, and so you're saying that this line you have, is it this line or or, or the next line, or does it does it matter? Is it the chords? Um, or the times? I am going to try run yours again. Hold on. It might have been the fact that I was you. Yeah, we're grand. All right, I was doing something stupid. <laughs> okay, no worries. I, I was, I was, I, I didn't realize I was using my points. Oh. And then I, I, I just commented out if not uh, yeah. for your stuff. Just Sorry. To, I, was trying to be smart. Smart. I was trying to be smart here so that if you hadn't run this cell, it would default to these values. Um, but obviously, I was not yeah. being really smart at all in the end. Sorry, that's probably. Shane, can I ask you something here? Yeah. Go back to your list of picked points there. Mm -hmm. All right, so you have uh, picked these points from integer frames, if you like. You can't have half a frame or a fraction yeah. of a frame. So why are we bothered with the fractional part of the number then? Why not just- Oh, we're, we're, we're not. Frame number. I mean, we're not. So you Oh, we're see, not, okay. You can see here that I, I basically round it. So this basically- Ah, okay, I see that now, yeah, yeah. fair enough. Um, it's just that it comes out from the plot because the plot doesn't know that these are integers, so it gives gotcha. you the yeah. So no, yeah, you're right. We don't we don't care about the the fractional part at all. Um, okay, so now we have height time of the CME front, and um, the different plot symbols here are using those two different approximations I talked about. My really simple and trivial plane of sky one, and a bit more of a correct one um, that takes into account uh, both coordinates. But within error bars, they're basically the same. So let's not worry about that too much. Um, uh, I don't actually think I want to do this anymore. Uh, okay. So then we can get into something a little bit more interesting. And, and this is basically the last thing that I have. And then we can try and do tech troubleshooting and other things and general questions is that we could basically, basically try and fit some really simple models to the data. So the simplest model that we could think that should, should work is a constant velocity model. So the acceleration or dvdt um, uh, is equal to zero. We can then integrate that up to get height as a function of time. So it'll be some constant plus v zero t. So that's, that's, that's one equation for a constant velocity model. Um, or we could have a constant acceleration model. And in this case, um, a is not equal to zero, but it's equal to a constant. Integrate up once to get velocity and then twice to get height. So we could fit these two functions to our data, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So I define a constant velocity model, uh, which just is a, me, me coding up this equation really simply. So h0 plus v0t, and a constant acceleration model, um, which is H0, V0, T plus half A, T squared. And then going to just, to make fitting a bit easier, I'm going to convert the times to, to start at the first time. So the first time will be zero. The next time will be plus however many seconds and so on and so forth. Actually, I might just print this out so it's clear. Um, T0. Yeah, so this is now in seconds from zero. Uh, it just makes things a bit easier. And then we can basically make a fit. Um, so this is one of the functions I imported earlier on. And I'm not sure if you guys know it, but it, it basically does what it says. It fits curves. Um, so I give it the function I want to fit. I give it uh, the dependent data or the X coordinate, if, if you want, uh, the Y data. We don't have to give either of these, but um, we always have errors, which we should always include. And then this is an initial guess. So I'm going to say that the CME has to start, or I'm guessing it starts where I've clicked. And I'm going to guess it has a velocity of uh, 350 kilometers per second. And I then can pass this into the fish, and it'll uh, basically give me uh, a result. And I can extract the fit parameters from that result. And so I get. H0 is three solar radii, and it has a velocity of 2,400 kilometers per second. So that's kind of up there on the upper end of, of CMEs. Um, seems a bit 
low to me. Um, but, you know, uh, so then we can do the same thing for our constant acceleration model. Uh, it's the same sort of thing, give it the model, uh, the x coordinate, the y's, and our initial guess. Um, and so we get a slightly different answer uh, for h0. Velocity is much higher, and we see that it's decelerating. Um, yeah, and then so what we can do is we can basically plot these uh, on top of our on top of our measured values and see how good or bad we're doing. Um, and yeah, these these aren't great. As I said, there's uh, a number of things that we probably need to take into account. Um, so these two data points down here are in the core two field of view. The rest of these are in the C2 field of view. The rest of these are in C3. And oftentimes when you go between telescopes, because they're different sensitivities, it's very hard to identify the same feature. So that, that might explain why this point is off. Um, and then just for fun, we can then estimate uh, by just you know uh, solving our, our equations for t given uh, a 1 AU distance, we can figure out how long we would estimate it would take um, a CME to arrive at 1 AU. And so for a constant acceleration, constant velocity model, it's 17 hours. And for our constant acceleration model, it's also 17 hours or minus seven hours. That can't be right. So we'll just ignore that and say that uh, it's 17 hours. Um, so we covered a lot there. I don't expect you to take in a lot at all. This was just an example of what can be done um, and kind of showing you some really simple examples of, of the kind of analysis you, you can do. Um, I thought we could spend the rest of the time maybe trying to solve any technical problems or just general questions about any of the sessions that we've had so far. Um, I don't really mind we can talk about any of them um, going forward. So has everyone been able to execute this, at least in the binder online, if not um, locally on their own machines? OK, that's really good. Um, is there Was any the question? binder quick or slow common? Uh, how did the binder? I, I haven't used it before. Um, it was it was totally fine, actually. It's pretty cool. I didn't know about binder. This is pretty awesome. I think you can develop your own because like if you have private repos, you have to do your own binder hub. Yeah, yeah, you 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 can host your own kind of in on premises version of, of Binder, and there's also Colab as well. So Colab is, is a Google version, and it's yep. kind of similar. You can point it to a repo, and it'll uh, load things up. No, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty nice, especially if you're collaborating with someone to do some like test out some new stuff. I think that's pretty cool. It's like the, the Google Drive version of, of Python development. Yeah, kind of, yeah. It's pretty neat. That's a really um, useful tutorial, I think. Um, yeah, I found out what the error was in the sorry to cut across you, Peter, but you had the same problem as me. It was uh, an issue with the NASA website that the last code was on and our IT. Not a firewall, but something slightly different. I don't know. Hey, you really, oh, that's uh, man, ISIT, they're so they're great at helping us, but they're they're like firewall is super annoying. Were, were we blocked by NASA or were, were, was JIS blocking us? Uh, I don't know. He said that he had to add it to the DNS manually uh, and that okay. it was a problem with NASA.gov. So okay. But yeah, sorry, uh, to, to trash from the point. It was no, no, really no, it's good. Version. It's good because I was really confused about how, how what was happening if, if it wasn't a download error. Um, I should maybe mention um, just on that point. Um, so where are my downloads? Okay. Um, so Fido um, returns uh, essentially a list but it's not totally a list. Um, so dot, um, if there is download errors, yeah, there's this dot errors thing. 
And if you print that, that will contain any download errors that you got. Um, so you can, you, you'll know if something hasn't downloaded or hopefully you should know if something hasn't downloaded. Um, so that might be useful. And that works for FIDO anywhere. So in SunPy, in Radio Spectra, in whatever else you might be using FIDO in, um, you can always look at the dot error, excuse me, dot errors of the fetch result. And if there are any errors, it means they haven't downloaded. Um, so that's so Jen, would, would that have worked for me the other day when I was having problems getting some of the data from a FIDO query? So I think put in a loop to check that and to throw an exception. I, if, if I think error. the problem you that, that you were having was on the search. Mm. It was that when you searched, you were only getting the, the XRS data and not the AIA data. That's it. And yeah, yeah so <laughs> again, it's kind of it's really hard for SunPy to know is a service down or is it just not giving us answers or, or, or what so um yeah sometimes it's very difficult for us to give useful error messages um to like external apis but it's definitely something that we need to try and try and improve on so i don't think that would have helped in that specific case okay um but i do think that the servers were just down because i tried it later on and it worked fine yeah no it, it did work fine for me later on i haven't gone back to it since yeah so that's just kind of one of those things uh, you know I guess anything on the internet, it's never guaranteed to be alive when you go to try and access that, that resource. Um, how did anyone or everyone else get on? Was there any big problems? Mohammed, did you manage to get anywhere in the end? Uh, now I, I'm running on Binder because I have still some issues uh, to to download the data locally, but for some reason, the, the progress bar is stopped. Like it doesn't yeah, so at 100%. If, but. If, if that does happen on your own, on, on Binder, uh, what you want to do is uh, restart the kernel and then basically just rerun the cells. Uh, you can, yeah, you can just do cell run all. Sometimes on Binder, it, it just can't. I guess it just gets stuck with resources or there's lots of people using Binder and it just will stop. Um, so if, if you try it a couple of times, it should hopefully get you the whole way through. I had to do that myself. <laughs> yeah, and locally also uh, on my laptop, it doesn't uh, download the data completely. <laughs> I don't know why. That's very strange. Again, I mean, you, you heard Pierre Pe say that, that like in, in Dias there was issues getting to the server. I mean, if you have any underlying network or connectivity issues, it's, it, yeah, that could explain why you're having um, problems downloading stuff. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, can I ask a question, please? Uh, yeah. So how can, or is it possible to modify this code to obtain this, the, the mass of the CME, maybe from the intensity values um, to convert it to masses? So that's a good question. Um, so, okay, let's start with um, uh, with C2 for a second. We'll go back to where C2 was. A great question. <laughs> it is, yeah. Parks um, back to our okay. PhDs. So and here, I'm printing some properties from the C2 maps. Uh, I'll, I'll print them um, from the same. And um, so what you kind of have to know is that the background, um, the F corona, so the really bright part of the corona um, is unpolarized, yeah? So the, the, the emission from, from the F corona is unpolarized. However, the emission from CMEs is, is very polarized. And if we want to try and estimate the CME mass, what we need to do is we need to take uh, polarized images, a series of polarized images to try and find what contribution is polarized, which means it's coming from the background F corona, or sorry, unpolarized, which is coming from the background F corona versus polarized, which is coming from the CMEs. Um, and so you need, you really need polarized uh, brightness measurements to do this. And you can see here, uh, in this case, the polarization filter, which is the, this, the second one, is clear. So the telescope has um, basically filters that it slots in and out of the optical path to take different measurements. And in this case, all of these measurements don't have polarization information. So it would be very difficult to convert these maps 
into CME masses. Um, and I don't know about the core two or the core three. I think it's the same. Um, I'll just print them out because why not? Um, so basically, you have to have um, polarization measurements to try and obtain at least for the most part, you need polarization measurements to try and obtain uh, CME masses. Yeah, and but again, that, that's it. So, you know, if um, from the total brightness measurements where you don't have polarized brightness measurements, I think they can make estimates yeah. of what the F corona is and then take that away. So you're only left with apparently the CME contribution and then you get mass from that. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, we kind of did that. So we, we took a we took a background or base difference image. And so whatever is left after you do this background subtraction should be related to the CME mass. But for example, in this event, the shock was extremely bright. And that's, I mean, how would you deal with that? I mean, I'm not sure actually, I don't really know. Cause you that's can. not, <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's not, it's not trivial and uh, yeah. Yeah, the truck wave will may, maybe will give uh, misleading values because it's too bright at some frames. Yeah, yeah it, it definitely would. And also, um, you really need to use the proper uh, prep routines. So unfortunately, they're part of SSW IDL and you have to properly prep yeah. the images. So I've just taken the FITS files and done some simple things to them. But in order to get... Um, mm -hmm uh like calibrated images which you could try and convert into cme masses you need to use the proper prep routines uh, on the data to get it to the correct scientific units it takes into account the flat fielding the vignetting all of the optical um, effects that happen along the telescope path i've just basically done a, a really simple analysis to show that you can extract a high time plot but there's an awful lot of work you have to do to I guess, fully use uh, coronagraph images, at least from, from Lasco and, and stereo anyways. But it's a really good question. Yeah, so I was going to ask, you know, um, Mohammed, if you're interested, the codes to convert CME intensity to mass exist in SolarSoft IDL. And I guess a follow on question to that is, is there plans to do it in Python as well? Shano, I'm not sure if they're doing that, are they? I mean, who's they? So who's like, they? Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> you. If, if, if you want it in Python, then then yeah, it's definitely something that we can do. Uh, it's all kind of you know contributor led. So if someone wants it in Python, we'll help them do it. But you know, no one's paid to develop SunPy, uh, so it's all contributed time on people who are doing analysis that they want to do or have to do, and they want to do it through Python. So um, at the moment, the CME um, slash Chronograph slash heliospheric imager stuff, it's not great just because the community is focused more on, on solar disk observations. Um, but, you know, that's not to say that we can't you know, start something. Yeah. I have the couple yeah, here. Great. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other general random questions? I mean, now is the time. Uh, if there's no questions and there's no tech support, we can finish early. But I mean, th this is the time where you can have random questions about anything we've covered so far or Python or yeah, whatever. Well, I think we, at some point, uh, we should start discussing um, a way to, to, um, to include LOFAR products or standardize somehow. Um, yeah. I mean, so I, I don't know, Owen, have, have you spoken about your, the HDF5 stuff at all to, in, in, in this, this, to Kamen or anyone? Or? I haven't. Um, what, do you, what do you want to talk about? Oh, I don't know. I was just going to say that m maybe we, we could, or you, you could outline um, the fact that, you know, we can now produce a standard file like a HDF5 file that has all of the metadata and everything you need from the outputs from a single low fire station, i.e. Yeah. the Irish one or the Bulgarian one in, in the future. Yeah, so as as you gathered yesterday, Carmen, the 
the raw data that comes out of a low fire station is kind of extremely raw with very little header information and so on kind of you have to do a few tricks to to plot it um the reason that is is that apparently the single station data wasn't really meant to be used for science purposes it was just for diagnostics and so on but it turns out you can use it for science purposes yeah, and we do uh, so just based off of all of that there are efforts nowadays to take your your bst files which have pretty much no header in them and put mm -hmm. them in either fits or more maybe more appropriate nowadays is hdf5 files um, and there are codes that are almost are just about developed to be able to do that. Um, and that, that will be part of a software package known as ILISA. And ILISA is developed by uh, Tobias Karotti. Uh, the, he's a part of Lofar Sweden. And I can pass you on those codes if, if, if you wish. And then basically the output is like a standardized file where you don't need to manipulate the data and do lots of different things to it, you mm. know? Yeah. it's just cool. not quite there yet it's not like complete so um no yeah. i mean that yeah i think that's fine i was i was more think i mean this is all very cool of course and we'll definitely be using it in the future i was more thinking about the the interferometric um, um outputs because you know usually the flow is you start from measurement sets um and then go into um save the outputs to like fits files or something but um, sure there there could be i assume it, it wouldn't be so hard to develop some code to 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 do be able to uh, inject the information into uh some maps once you produce your images you know from the interferometric imaging sure thing um well we then have pipelines go. in order to do that um so I'm kind of developing my own pipelines where we use something called the default pre-processing pipeline. That's like low fire standard, uh, mm -hmm. how to go from, how to calibrate your measurement sets basically. Yeah. And then we use WS clean to produce the images and deconvolve uh, the yeah. images. Yeah. And then we use Python at the very end to go from RA deck into Helio projector. So those steps all exist right now. In fact, Pagin uh, has, has come a long way in developing something standardized that we can all use yeah. um which you may see i'm not sure what pietro's plans are for his workshop uh, at astron so you may see a little bit of that at astron and um, as well as that i've taken some it can be rather slow when you're doing many measurement sets in sequence especially if you have like 10 of them for 10 different frequencies you know if you want to process them all and image them all it could take hours and hours I'm yeah. developing a pipeline right now that's doing the does that in parallel, so it's it's pretty quick. All you need to do is point to your solar measurement sets and your calibrator measurement sets and a model, and just do everything for you. Um, I wonder if I can share that. Um, I'm not sure if I've talked to you about that before, Carmen, mm. or if I shared that with you before, but I'll, I'll send it on now. I mean, just to to, to add, or I mean, the the key thing for for SunPy is if you have the requisite WCS information, you can load it into a SunPy map. It doesn't matter what it is. If you have that information, it'll go into a map. And if you have, if it's FITS compliant, it'll go into a map automatically. You don't have to do anything at all. It's it's only if you have non-standard WCS that, uh, that you have to have kind of custom support. So as Owen said, I mean, if you can extract that information from the observations and put it into the right format, it will just go into a SunPy map kind of without any hassle. Okay, so you, you guys mean like right at the very end, the developments yeah. that are going on to to, to, to get low far and nice SunPy images kind of thing? Yeah, well, yeah, that, that's what I was thinking about. But of course, the entire pipeline is, is important. Uh, but yeah. Uh, have you seen, Cam, and the, there's a page on SunPy with sample low far data. Yeah. Where it does that conversion. Have you seen that? No. no. Uh, where is it coming again? It'll be an example again. gallery. Um, I see a note notebook by Laura. Yeah, that's the one. Maybe I can share actually if this loads up.
create a helio for yeah so it, it it's basically um actually shane you can probably describe this a little bit better than i can um yeah. maybe you should because you know these sky coordinate systems um yeah do you want to do yeah yeah would you, you yeah um yeah so i mean do you want to just send me that link because i actually can't find yeah. it Where is it i thought it was in one of the example galleries or is it yeah i sent it in the zoom chat there okay sweet yeah yeah one sec sorry oh man yeah it, it is in one of the galleries i thought that's what it was uh, yeah. Okay, hopefully you can you can see my screen and read yeah. that not too bad. Uh, yeah, so standard stuff are imports. Um and I don't know exactly what the low fire image is, but it's it's obviously in a fits file. Um, um yeah, it's what comes out well, the pipeline that I described when you run WS clean, you right. get an image um decomposed. That's what that's what yeah um so then again this is just checking so that we know what the fits headers are uh, in in that file and it's ra and deck not surprisingly because it's, it's a low fire image um extracting the time the frequencies um, and then really crucially uh, you have to know the earth location i think pierce kind of mentioned this this yesterday and also laura is that um to do the transformation from RA and DEC properly into Helio Projective, you need to know the location of the observer. And in this case, I'm going to guess that that's Burr. Yeah, 52.6. No, oh, no, this would be the... That would like be the basic array. array. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but anyways, it, like, yeah, you need to know exactly where that is. Um, and so you get an Earth location. I don't know. Let me that. Well, would that be... Oh, and would that be the 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 face center of the yeah yeah the exact face the, center the ring. Ring. Yeah. Um, so that'd be the the antenna that you use for the face center probably yeah yes and the accuracy there potentially yeah I'd have to actually look at where exactly that is yeah um right because you're doing interferometric so you're using a bunch of antennas but exactly yeah. Right, but one is at zero zero. Yeah. Yeah. So we can get this as an Earth location, and then we can use all that AstroPy basically stack to convert that to GCRS coordinate. Um, and then basically, what this is doing is uh, we're calculating the reference coordinate um, for the map that we're going to create. Um, so we're extracting. Basically, the, the the headers from the fits file, so the, the CR vals, the C units, um, and we're just setting all of them. So we give it a sky chord uh, that's going to be at this position in GCRS because we've just done that um, at this time, and then basically the observer coordinates. Um, and then once we have that, we can then transform this to a helio projective coordinate system, which is what this line here is, is doing it's a bit annoying because it's wrapped but basically we do a transform to we want to transform it to helio projective and the observer is low fire which we defined up there so that's really the key i guess transform and then once we have that um we need to make the correct um c delta keywords for our new map this is going to be our map in helio projective coordinates now um, we need the, the p angle um to get the solar north in the right spot essentially and then this is just a helper uh, a function that helps you make a valid um sun pi map header um, and so it takes the data array a reference cord reference pixel um scale rotation and then some some meta information and it's basically just a dictionary of of things uh, of of keys which are the standard kind of wcs header keywords and then very similarly to spectrogram yesterday most mm, most times most sunpy objects you can give it a data array and a meta data array 
and it will understand how to create the, the thing from it. So there's our map. And then you can just plot that. You can interact with that now as a normal sometime map. So you can plot it on top of AIA, you can do contours, you can do um, all sorts of fun stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think it shows the rotated version yeah, at the end there. Yeah, so again, so you can see here in, in this image, this is the native coordinates of the data. And it's not aligned to our, our normal solar north. Um, so again, like I was showing, you can just call rotate on the map. And then I guess, yeah, she's just extracting a sub map here. So we're going to zoom in obviously on, on the little radio burst. And then we can plot a nice figure of um, the solar disk. In this case, it's just a representation and nice contour plot of the uh, radio data on top of it. Yeah, type three or something like that. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, yeah, I don't remember exactly what, what it is. Um, we have used this the, the that code on MWA fits as well. That works, so it just transforms it into helio projective. So it's it's pretty versatile. Mm. Yeah, I think it's it's been well tested now as well because there there was some problems earlier on, but it was not really code problems. It was just definitions, whether things are epoch of date or epoch of time. And obviously if you if you mix the two of them, things can things can get mixed up. Um, and stuff like this, the fact that you know the the phase center isn't in the fits file is kind of annoying. Like that's something if it was in there then you would have one one less uncertainty about all this stuff. Because obviously if you get this wrong, it can actually for solar observations, it's probably not a big deal. But like if you're looking at lunar eclipse things or something like that, then if you change the position on the Earth, that can actually make, make a big difference. Um, and if you're doing really, really fine comparisons, uh, probably not in the low fire frequency range, but higher frequency, then shifting your, your observer could have um, nasty side effects. I'm, the, I wouldn't, um, maybe it's in there, but it just hasn't been applied that way, you know, in, in the FITS file. I, yeah. I should check. I mean, instead yeah, of like hard coded no, numbers of, of where it is, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Also, as I remember in the previous version, the, the solar P angle is to define the epoch should be J2000, not uh, something, not the default. The default is not correct, but uh, in this, uh, yeah, this line, um, P1 equals uh, the p angle yeah um but uh, yeah previously if, if we do, do not define the epoch time yeah uh, yeah. yeah i remember it, having I problems with, that with all the versions now. yeah that's a epoch of date versus j2000 epoch or, or, or whatever um yeah 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 it's like previously i ran into some problems when i do not define j j epoch but uh, no that epoch Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think there's some kind of like uh, default differences between astronomers and solar physicists. I think because we, we usually use epoch of date and they usually use J2000, is it? I don't, I've never fully understood that to be honest. One of these lovely uh, differences between um, um, yeah, solar stuff and non solar stuff. So, yeah, we can already load the data in. We could obviously make this a bit nicer, you know, if, you know, again, if someone opens an issue and says, I'd like to be able to read in a low fire fits file into a map, can you add, you know, uh, a map source so that it does it for you? We can absolutely look at doing that. Like if, if there's a need and people want something, you know, that's something we could definitely um, look at doing. Uh, as I said before, it's kind of like, Unless people ask for things, they won't get done. And if more people ask for them, then they'll get more priority, I guess, from the SunPy team to try and support them. Mm. This is kind of awkward to have to do all this stuff, especially because most of it is automatable. I mean, the vast majority of this, all you really need to know is, is this. Everything else is extracted from the, from the FITS file, as far as I can tell anyways. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, this this method is it looks like just elegant, 
previously I do is re really uh, like manually rotate rotate and uh, scale everything. It, it took um, a lot of code to do yeah. the same thing. But... I thought it was fun as well to try to de debug it. <laughs> yeah, but well, this method is uh, it's uh, robust and elegant. I really like this method. Yeah. I mean, a lot of this comes down to that AstroPy coordinate stack. You know, it is this stack that understands how to transform things. Once you get it into a WCS and a SkyCord, you can really do it. It's actually really, really powerful for what you can do, even if it's not straight away obvious. Um, I'll stop here on the screen. I don't want to share that anymore. Cam, I know you've worked a bit with it, the MWA images. Do you guys do something similar, or do you use Solar Soft or? Uh, no, I mean it's yeah, they're they're processed in Python, but uh, not. Unfortunately, at, at, at the end of it all, you know, you have. I, I don't quite remember. It's been a while since I worked on those. Yeah. Um, I think I tried putting the, the output of those FITS files into um, a SumPy map at the time. It was quite difficult. I remember. Yeah. I'm sure now it's yeah. much easier with the new updates. So. I know that there was the same kind of difficulties. Uh, there was the MWA, we were talking to Divya um, O'Brien about it, and we're talking to Bin Chen about it in the OVSA. I mean, we didn't have a common way of just taking our eight deck images, converting them to helio projective, you know. And there was talk of making it totally standardized for all radio stuff, um, but we didn't um, we didn't really follow up on it. But I think it still should be done. That and, and that code that Shane just showed there, I think that's 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 definitely a start of it, you know. Yeah, yeah it looks very cool. I mean, and I'm, I'm pretty sure this can all be quickly packaged into some. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no reason why, you know, you couldn't have a low fire pie or something. I don't know what you'd call it, but some sort of specialized package, you know, specifically designed to deal with this sort of data. Yeah, well, Probably at least specifically for solar, it would be yeah. extension yeah. to to some pi or some I don't know satellite package. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, that's kind of what the idea or one of the ideas behind like affiliated packages is. These are packages that build on top of SunPy but are a bit more niche, yeah. uh, specialized. You know, that they, they don't belong in SunPy because it's too it's too too niche. So yeah, you definitely have something that you know. Solar low fire something or other, and it would be good to see because again you can you can stop duplication of effort and have a common way of doing things and build a skill pool and a knowledge pool of how, how to do things you know using that that, that bit of software yeah that you can develop. Definitely. 